On behalf of McLear and Port Huron, hello and welcome to this educational program on COVID-19 vaccine facts. I'm your moderator, Kelly DiNardo. We will be hearing from Dr. John Brooks, an, an infectious disease specialist and the chief medical officer at McLear and Port Huron. At the end of the presentation, Dr. Brooks will be answering the questions that were emailed in prior to the, today's webinar. If you have any additional questions, please send them in via the chat. And if we have time, uh, we'll ask Dr. Brooks to answer those. Over the past year, Dr. Brooks has been an incredible resource. He literally trained for situations like the COVID-19 pandemic. Not only has he provided guidance for our hospital, but his expertise has been shared throughout the McLaren health healthcare system and even with the Detroit Tigers. Dr. Brooks, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Hey, it is my pleasure. I'm so glad to be here. Welcome to St. Clair County, Santa Lac County, and anybody via the web. So we're going to be talking about the COVID-19. Um, so Kelly, can we shrink some of these boxes to the right? I think you need to go on your view options. Wow. So if you can go into full screen. How's that? Except yep. it has you. Yep, looks good. <laughs> All right. So COVID-19 vaccine facts. We're going to chat about that. So as Kelly said, I'm an infectious disease uh, specialist. I'm board certified. I think it'll be my next, next little slide here. I trained at Wayne State University. I did my internship, residency, and fellowship there. Uh, and as you can, I've been doing this for a little while now. So um, I am, of course, the chief medical officer here at McLaren Port Huron, but I'm also the medical director of infection prevention for McLaren Health. So I've picked up some things along the way here. All right, so question that we're gonna to try to answer. Lots of them, kind of go through this and much, much more. So let's start with how do vaccines work? So a little slide here. In general, vaccines are gonna work with our body to help us fight off something that uh, we don't wanna get infected with. So whether it's a bacteria, a virus, um, vaccines work with their immune system to help us so that we don't have to get an actual infection. So when we think about measles, mumps, rubella, uh, we think about diphtheria, we think about um, these things that try to invade us and hurt us all the time, and we have vaccines for them. So COVID is no different. It's a virus that of course tries to uh, harm us uh, quite a bit. So when we look at um, the COVID vaccine, off to the right-hand side, you'll see the vaccines uh, work by basically uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the COVID-19 virus, um, is an RNA virus. And so what they've been able to do is take a piece of that uh, from its uh, RNA, and it's able to make the protein, which is a spike protein. So once we're vaccinated, um, your body will look and say, wow, I'm not supposed to have that in me. It'll start to make antibodies and activate T cells to fight against that new invader. And then we're going to make antibodies and immune response that are going to fight off the, the new protein that's actually part of the virus. Probably one of the most important questions I get all the time is, can I get COVID from the vaccine? And the answer is it's impossible because the vaccines do not contain any live virus. They actually don't even really contain any viral pieces. It just creates a small portion of a protein from the virus. So are vaccines safe? Well, I certainly think they're safe. Uh, I've got my COVID vaccine. Um, my first one was December 19th, so right, right early in the process. And as you can tell, many millions of people have now had the COVID-19 vaccine, and uh, we are having the most intense safety monitoring that's ever occurred for vaccines in our history. Um, we're really monitoring them closely. Um, you're able to go to your phone and your website and uh, sign in and report back to uh, the FDA any signs or symptoms that you were having along the way. So there's a really complex process uh, that's in place to try to help us monitor. So we worry about, um, are there serious safety issues? So the answer is no. There are some rare reactions that can occur. The most common is allergic reaction. And as we've gone through with the uh, Moderna and Johnson, sorry, Moderna and uh, Pfizer vaccine, um, those two, they utilize a chemical that helps stabilize that type, that type of vaccine, which is an mRNA vaccine. And that PEG uh, molecule that's in there, um, seems to be why we can get an allergic reaction. So people have had trouble with other injectables uh, may have a reaction to it. And then we've all seen a little more recently that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, uh, there's a very rare chance of a serious blood clot. So we'll talk about that for a moment. So when we think about uh, this amount, uh, it was about one in a million 
So when we think about blood clots related to a therapeutic and the vaccines are therapeutic, uh, when we look at the birth control pill, uh, the risk is about one to one in a thousand or one to 2,000 of ladies who take the birth control pills to develop a blood clot. So when we do magnitudes, we look and say, really, with this particular vaccine, it's, it's very, very unlikely, and the risk is very, very small. Uh, we've learned quite a bit about it. We know what to do about it. And it's pretty fascinating because it looks like uh, the blood clot issue is just with what are called the viral vector vaccines. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But uh, those particular vaccines uh, elicit immune response, and that seems to make um, some difficulties with antibodies against heparin-induced uh, thrombocytopenia. So blood clots are a concern, but certainly when we look at the risks of other common medications, the risk is much, much lower than it would be. And we've learned uh, how to recognize and what to do about it. But regardless, it's an extremely rare risk. And when we think about COVID, the risk of getting COVID as a young person or an older person and getting very sick and dying is much greater than a one in a million chance. As far as short-term side effects, that certainly is possible. Uh, most people will get a sore arm. About 86% of the people that report back will say a little bit of a short sore arm has occurred. Other than that, people do well. They may feel a little fluish with a little fever, chill, um, malaise, some body ache would not be unusual. Uh, but again, it's pretty mild, lasts about a day, well taken care of with some Tylenol or Motrin. And at this stage of the game, we have no evidence of any long-term side effects. Um, the people that were first vaccinated in the first trials, um, they are now at uh, 10 and 11 months. Um, and we look at that group of people and they're having no significant side effects at this time. Are they effective? This is what's really exciting about the COVID vaccines. Uh, more than 99% of the people who are vaccinated have been protected from severe disease or hospitalization. When we look at other vaccines, we get pretty happy with 80 or 85% uh, efficacy. And here we are with this 21st century vaccine that's giving us great protection. When we sit and think about what does this mean? So severe disease means sick enough to be hospitalized, um, to be uh, worse than that, to require respiratory support, require a ventilator. Um, and those are all things that are really bad with COVID uh, and people who are vaccinated are not progressing on to have that difficulty. A question we keep getting is, can you still get COVID if you've been vaccinated? So when we talk about breakthrough COVID, it's a rare event and um, it's gotten quite a bit of press. And what I try to do is think of it the other way, but let's first talk about no vaccine is 100% effective. So that means there will be some people that are vaccinated that will still uh, obtain the infection. Uh, the number here you're seeing is 0.1% of people who have been vaccinated do get breakthrough COVID and they are generally very mildly ill. We can talk about our McLaren experience of our 15,000 employees, about 46 uh, have gotten breakthrough COVID after they were vaccinated. None of them have been hospitalized, none of them have been very sick at all. So that's a really important thing is that although you've been vaccinated for COVID, you may get the infection, but if you do, it's gonna be extremely mild. And there's some other questions that we'll ask about that. So why do I need to wear a mask if I've been vaccinated? Well, first of all, right after you've been vaccinated, you're still not fully protected. So certainly in the few weeks after vaccination, you absolutely must wear a mask. It still helps protect those around us who are vulnerable. And as far as how does this work in real world situations, we're working on that, uh, but there's some exciting things to talk about. And I think we'll talk about that in a little bit. Well, I need a booster dose. When we talk about this, we don't know for sure, but I can tell you that Pfizer and uh, Moderna are some of the two bigger manufacturers already working on coming up with booster doses. So why do we need a booster dose? I guess a good time we can start to talk a bit about variants. So we've heard about that in the news. So when we think about, well, what is a variant? Well, let's first talk about viruses. So what does a virus do? Well, we think about the internet, we think about things going viral. Well, that's based on what we've learned about viruses. Think about the flu. So it starts out with a few people and then down the road, lots and lots of people get it. So when we think about COVID, so it's a virus, it's an RNA virus. It's able to go from person to person through respiratory um, droplets. Um, it is able to something that we can give to people by coughing and sneezing. Um, so, and also through the air around us when there's lots of virus in the air. So we can get into difficulties that when small numbers of people get a virus then they can give it to more and more people, especially by the respiratory route like we see with influenza. So, Concerns are gonna be, 
why is it important that we do things like masking and um, why do we need to consider things like a booster dose? So when we talk about the variants, um, all viruses are able to change themselves over time. That is actually how they work. It's how they're able to regenerate themselves. You think about the flu, it's new every year. If you get a flu shot every year. So with COVID, as it's infecting more and more of the human population of our planet, the virus is changing itself. And that's what viruses do. They, they change their genetics a bit. So as they mutate, that cause variants. So they're just standard mutations that occur. Now a mutation, when it occurs in a virus, has to be one that allows the virus to keep going, still to infect the host, and then usually not to go on to kill the host. Because if you get a virus, it ends up in the death of the host, it doesn't go on to other people. So a highly effective virus is one that makes people sick, is able to easily transmit to other people, and um, it, it happens with activities and behaviors like breathing, so it's easy to transmit to others. So as far as the variants, the whole point of the companies when they come up with vaccines for the variants, as the virus changes, as the virus changes its uh, RNA, um, it may evade our immune system or prior vaccinations. And so we're gonna certainly want to go on and have ways to give different kinds of vaccines over time, maybe as a booster, as I'll call it, so that we're holding into the vaccinations ways to fight off the variants or the mutations that occur over time. When I talk about some vaccine myths, vaccine cards are just a way to track you. Well, I certainly don't believe that at all. Um, any of us that are in healthcare will be able to tell you that the MICR, the, the MICR, uh, is a way that we document all our vaccines and all of us. All your kids have their vaccines in MICR and uh, our flu shots go in MICR. Uh, and you know, when you get your tetanus shot, it goes into MICR. And it's a way for the state database to know that we're vaccinated. So when we talk about public health, let's put the word public first. And that's what's important about things like vaccines and, and why we have databases. And so we think about sending our kids off to school, right? They get all their routine vaccines before they go to school because they're in with a bunch of other kids. We want them to be safe. Uh, the reason we do a lot number is that's for safety monitoring. Um, our vaccine cards are for our records. Um, I don't know what about you, but when I got in mine, it's a personal card. They write the information on it. It's mine for me to see. Uh, my information do, does go into MICR though. Um, why you want to keep the card in a safe location? Well, as we're moving through, we can look what some other countries have done and they're doing those vaccine cards may work as a bit of a passport. And we don't know if that's going to happen here. It may, it may not. Uh, but certainly if you want to travel, it may be very helpful in the future to have that because other countries may require it. So we certainly know that that's false. The vaccines can make you infertile. So we know that this is certainly not true. Um, uh, basically, a theory floated around, uh, not from the medical community, that there was a concern because of some protein similarities um, to the female uh, reproductive tract and COVID virus, that there could be a difficulty with infertility. Uh, we have no evidence of this. There's no scientific evidence of it. And uh, it really doesn't make much sense. So um, there was a concern the vaccine will adhere to the implants in your body. Uh, this is certainly not true. Um, when we get a vaccine, especially the COVID vaccines, it's gonna, your body's going to make some antibodies, get a T cell response, um, and it's going to fight off if your body gets infected with COVID, but it doesn't cause anything that's gonna impact or stick to the back to the implants within our body, whether it's a hip or another foreign body. The vaccines alter your DNA. It's actually one of my favorite questions. So the answer is, of course they don't. Um, the vaccines are an RNA vaccine, so it can't alter your DNA just by that piece of it. But also the, the vaccine goes into the cytoplasm of the cell, not in the nucleus of the cell. So it's not able to go in and, and alter it. It's also not how the vaccines work at all. It just turns on a protein factory within your cell uh, to make the protein so your body can fight off the COVID infection so you never get it. All right. So we've been getting a lot of great uh, questions via email um, as this webinar approach. So, um, so we'll just get started with those. Uh, our first question, um, can you talk a little bit about emergency use vaccines and what do you say to the people that think this COVID vaccine was pushed out too soon? All right, well, let's first talk about the definition of emergency use. So the FDA um, has to authorize other things that we utilize. So 
for an injectable drug uh, like the COVID vaccines, they have to go through and tell us whether or not it can be utilized. Um, an emergency youth authorization in this particular case for the vaccines means that the process um, was shortened a bit. And what that meant is that for, oh, let's say the most recent shingles vaccine, you know, it took about four years to go through that process to get full FDA approval. So when they go through that, there's many steps that have to happen and lots of bureaucracy, of course, that goes on. And then finally it gets approved. Well, first of all, we didn't have the luxury at this stage of the game. We needed to get a vaccine out uh, in the middle of this pandemic. And remember, it's the 21st century and we have amazing technology. So mRNA technology has been worked on for about 10 years. Um, we've been uh, aggressively trying to utilize this and that just fit very well uh, to fighting off uh, COVID. So when we think about why we would be concerned, well, emergency use is exactly what it sounds like emergency use. So it's an emergency situation and the FDA wanted to help us through this process. So they really didn't short any of the steps. They just kind of stacked them on top of each other. The only part of it that isn't done is of course a long-term follow-up, um, which is what we're gathering at this point in time. Good. Um, why are two doses needed? So at this point in time, when the clinical trials were done, and that's our first 20,000 or so people uh, that were receiving the vaccine, they found that if they gave one dose, it didn't give enough protection. It gave about 55 or 60% protection. And we certainly wanted to do better than that. And when they did the trial with the two doses, that's when we got that 95% protection. And that's a much better amount. So that's why we do the two, so that we get a much better immune response to give us better protection. Uh, do I need a vaccine if I've already had COVID? So if I've had COVID, do I need a vaccine? The answer to that is absolutely yes. So this is going to tie in a little bit to what we saw with um, the variants. So when we talk about natural infection, let's start there. So if you have COVID and you recover, by the grace of God, you do and you do well, um, you will have immunity. But we've learned that that immunity wanes. It means it goes away or it weakens over time. We know historically um, the coronaviruses, which this is what this falls into, those particular viruses, especially in kids, when they've looked at it over the years, in November, the kid can get a coronavirus and the exact same one they can get again in February. We usually would think when you get one infection, you're kind of protected for a long time. But coronaviruses are a little different. They don't generate a really strong immune response. They don't cause this flurry of T cell activity. Um, it tends to be a milder infection, so our body just doesn't really pay a lot of attention to it. So what's a little different, of course, is that COVID-19 causes SARS. It's very worse disease than that. Um, how soon after having, having had COVID-19 can you get the vaccine? One person was told they had to wait 90 days. So as far as the, the wait, so when we talk about um, vaccination after infection, um, the current guideline is you have to be without symptoms and out of quarantine. So that's about 14 days uh, after you've had the infection. Um, you can wait up to about 90 days. And this kind of ties into the last is that we have protection for about 90 days um, after original infection. Now we know that that is going to wane over time, that, that um, immune response will weaken over time. And so people will be at increasing risk as time goes by to obtain an infection. So what we want to make sure of is that if you've had COVID, that you do get vaccination. So why is this important? Because vaccination will improve your immune response such that hopefully you'll never get COVID. And more importantly, as the variants start to occur, the vaccines do give us better protection against variants than natural infection does. And as we've learned about that, it then becomes important to say, hey, if I had COVID three months ago, I really need to get my vaccine now because as the variants occur, I want to make sure that I'm protected from them. I'm young and healthy. Can't I just let my immune system do its own thing? Well, the answer is, is that you can, but um, the difficulty that we've run into is that if that is the choice that people make, then we can't tell who the person is that's going to get really sick. As of right now, I have a 31 year old uh, hanging around in my ICU that's really sick. So, and we've seen that through this entire pandemic that we have 30 year olds, four year olds and 50 year olds that seem to be otherwise very healthy that have gotten very, very sick. Um, yes, the old, the sick, when they get COVID, they don't do well, but that's kind of not unusual with about any infection because that's kind of the way things work. However, young, healthy people, um, 
we can't predict when they're going to be the one that gets a serious case of COVID and will go on to um, get serious pulmonary infection, pneumonia, and death. So since we know the vaccine is safe and effective, it's now easy to get, I certainly would proceed and get the vaccine. And do you know what the long-term effects could be, like the other health consequences? So as far as long-term effects from the COVID vaccine, as far as of right now, again, we were about 10 months uh, and there have been none seen. Um, it is unlikely um, that an mRNA vaccine would cause any long-term side effects or ongoing difficulties. However, we've definitely seen that with natural infection. And you may have seen that as what they're called long-termers, uh, people that had COVID that are now having ongoing difficulties. They have respiratory difficulties, um, they have fatigue, and they have some uh, neurological difficulties afterwards with some foggy brain, depression uh, that we've been seeing post-COVID. So uh, not getting the infection is the, the real goal so that you don't end up with long-term effects from the infection since the vaccine seems to have none. Can vitamins or, or supplements uh, help prevent a COVID infection? So being a healthy person, uh, regardless of what is trying to invade us, always helps us. So the bottom line is uh, having a good diet, eating well, uh, taking vitamins. I, I'm a vitamin taker myself with some C and D and E, uh, making sure that we get our vitamins. Uh, it helps protect us because it makes our immune system function well. But vitamins alone are not nearly enough to protect us from COVID. Um, you may do well if you get COVID, but again, if you're that person that we don't know those factors yet of why you proceed on to have a really serious case of COVID, uh, some vitamins are not going to be enough to protect you. Should I get a COVID vaccine if I have had reactions to other vaccines? So that is a really common question that we get. So if you've had a prior injectable medication cause anaphylaxis or a serious side effect, we look at people and say, you shouldn't have it and talk to your healthcare provider. Um, so the COVID vaccines, especially the two that we know the most about as far as reactions so far is gonna be the Pfizer and the Moderna. So those are mRNA vaccines. They have a uh, unique way that they work. So we talked a little bit, but let's go into this. So mRNA vaccines utilize um, small fragments of mRNA uh, that or have to be put into suspension that get into our body to get into a cell. So the way that that was done is this mRNA uh, gets coated by basically some fats, some fatty molecules and some cholesterol, uh, and then a molecule that's a stabilizer called PEG, so polyethylene glycol. Um, it's a common thing. If you've ever had a colonoscopy, you drank some of it to uh, have some fun with that. So it's a common medical uh, stabilizer. So, but people can be allergic to that, and we think that may be why with the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, people are having significant anaphylaxic reactions. Uh, so uh, if you have a known allergy to that, then you shouldn't get it. Uh, other than that, um, most people, if you're allergic to peanut butter or eggs or insect bites, um, there's nothing to do with that. So just because you have other allergies doesn't mean you can't get the COVID vaccine. Actually, you probably should, um, unless you've had a serious reaction to an injectable medication. Um, what are the ingredients in the vaccine and would any of the ingredients be harmful to me if injected by itself? So as we just discussed, so there's a small fragment of mRNA. And so think about that, that's a programming molecule. So when mRNA is in our cells and in the, the liquid part of the cells outside of the nucleus, um, that's where the factory is that makes all of our proteins. So we've got to deliver that mRNA into some cells. So for that to happen, we have mRNA, we have uh, some lipids, so those are some fats, and some cholesterol. So that's what's protecting that little native sec sequence, that little teeny piece of mRNA from getting deactivated by our system when it gets injected in, and it's able to deliver it into the cells. Um, there is also the peg that's a stabilizer, um, and uh, that's really what's in, in the major vaccines. Now, there is a different kind of vaccine, that's the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. That's a viral vector vaccine. It does work differently. So what they did is they took an everyday common cold adenovirus and they took its genetic material out of it and they were able to put that genetic material into that virus uh, that's gonna help program for that protein, that spike protein from COVID um, so that we can then get an immune response to that. So that one works a little differently, but again, they're, they're all about the same and that their goal is to turn on our mechanisms in our cells to make a protein to then fight off um, the COVID infection by turning on 
that immune system against those really particular proteins, the spike proteins specifically. And we know that blood clots can be a complication of a COVID infection. Um, and we've heard of the small, a number of people who received the Johnson and Johnson vaccine who had developed blood clots. So are blood clots a concern with the mRNA vaccine? So what we'll say is that from the mRNA vaccines, so that's going to be the Johnson and Johnson and Moderna vaccine, sorry, <laughs> the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, uh, those are mRNA. There has been no blood clot issues related to those. So the Johnson and Johnson, and then not in America, but AstraZeneca in the UK, which are both viral vector vaccines, they have had a small number of persons develop some blood clots. So it appears to be related to the immune response to the viral vector piece. Uh, it looks like that is the trigger for that. And um, those are some medicine. We know about something called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, which where the body makes some antibodies uh, against platelets, and we get a difficulty with that, and that's what causes clotting and bleeding. Um, it looks like the viral vector vaccines have a very rare chance of causing that to occur. We know how to treat it, um, and, and that's the issue. So we, we go back to, um, Kelly, go to the question again. So we know that the blood clots uh, can be a complication ah, of a COVID. Yes, yes, thank you. So infection. when we think about um, blood clotting, so we know that there's their rare risk from that, but COVID itself, now that can cause really severe blood clots. And we see that all the time. Uh, in our patients that are hospitalized, um, we have seen people that have clots in their legs and their arms, and then we see the serious blood clots that can be into their brain, into the large arteries and the smaller arteries going to the brain. And there's also been clots within the heart. So we know that the native infection causes lots and lots of clots, and that is really the big concern. The vaccines themselves, again, the viral vector vaccines may have a very small chance of having some clotting issue, uh, but it's immune related and again, very, very rare, um, but COVID gives lots of clots. And it's one of the reasons people go on to die um, is a clotting they get within their system. So um, if you have your choice, vaccination is certainly the way to go. Uh, the FDA recently approved Pfizer for 12 to 15 year olds. Um, I lost my what, what are your thoughts on that? So that we're very excited about. So here in Michigan, there's about 500,000 people that are about that age. So when we sit and think about other years, other viruses that go through, you know, those are young adults that uh, are now getting out into the world, right? They're in school, they're interacting with others, they're in sports, um, they have families, hopefully they have families. And, and so there's lots of places for them to come in contact with lots of people. And what we've seen with COVID in particular is that that age group, fortunately, they don't get real sick but it doesn't mean they don't have the virus. Actually, that group, a lot of them have had the virus. A lot of them have the virus currently, um, and that's the issue. So they can spread it on to others around them. So when we go back to the whole virus and viral bloom thought, when we look at how viruses work, like things going viral on the internet, um, if we can interrupt the virus getting to as many people as possible, then that's what's gonna make this virus go away or at least get to the point in time where it isn't affecting us to the great way it has been over the last year and a couple of months now. So the goal is that 12 to 15 year olds, if we can vaccinate them, we know we're gonna make a bigger impact on the furthering number of people that can get COVID. Um, and, and so that's a really great group for us to then to be able to get to. And now I know that some people are concerned, again, it's a newer vaccine, I'm not gonna say that it's not, but it is a 21st century and we have learned lots, you know, we can, send a little probe up and land on an asteroid floating through the universe and put a probe on Mars and fly a helicopter on Mars. So we have great technology and that's what we've been doing over the last many, many years. So here we are, 21st century, we've developed these wonderful vaccines that are highly effective and no evidence that there's gonna be any difficulties with long-term effects. So if I were fortunate to have a 12 or 15 year old, I would definitely get my kid vaccinated um, because I would wanna protect them because although kids generally don't get really sick from them, those that do get really sick and they end up in the ICU. So I'd like that not to be my kid. Very good. According to the St. Clair County Health Department, 44.8% of St. Clair County residents have received one dose of any vaccine and 36.4% are complete, meaning they've received either both doses of the Pfizer Moderna or one dose of the Johnson & Johnson. Can you talk uh, um, to us about what that means for the Michigan VAC to normal plan? Yes. So that's kind of fun. So we, we've all seen now we have the VAC to normal and that's a stage plan. 
And we know that we just hit the first target. So we're now at the 55% mark. So that's giving us some extra freedom, um, which we're really happy about. So it is a tiered structure. Um, you know, when we look at the rest of the state, we are slightly behind that. But what I can tell you is that in our 65 plus group, we've done a really good job in our county. We're now trying to catch up with the younger people. And I think we're gonna get there. Um, you know, our county is working hard. Dr. Mercantile at the health department has really been working hard and having a lot of clinics and McLaren and other uh, pharmacies are working really hard to get uh, some vaccines going. So we really want to make sure that we just keep on trying to get more and more people vaccinated. Um, you know, early on, we heard a lot about herd immunity. Can you um, talk about what that is and, and are we on track? Sure. So that's going to kind of tie right into uh, the back to normal. So when we talk about herd immunity, now for COVID, we really don't know the number. Um, we can look at other viruses. We can look at um, other infections that have occurred. And there's numbers that float around. Uh, I know currently they're looking at probably an 80% number to actually have good herd immunity. Uh, some are saying about 70%. So let's talk about back to normal. So we have those guidelines of 55, 60, 65, and 70. So we hit our 55%. So again, we get some extra freedom. It gets really good at 65% because that's when our indoor stuff, um, we don't have to uh, have limits on that any further. And at 70%, uh, the state will look and say that we're doing really well and we can get rid of just about all of the quarantine and, well, we'll still do quarantine people are affected, but all the guidelines of what happens to us in public. So it is exciting that there are chances to go through and, and step through that process and have increasing numbers of people vaccinated to improve our ability to get out in public and interact with those that we love. I'm looking forward to that too. Um, so what happens for, we've heard a lot of people that have only had maybe one dose of the Pfizer and or Moderna uh, vaccines. So what does that do with our herd immunity if people are only gonna get one? So when we look at the back to success, I know the state's using just the, the first dose vaccine then plus the two weeks. Um, we do have people that have only gotten one dose. They've not got their second dose. Either they had some side effects or just scheduling difficulties. So what we're really trying to get people to do is to, to try to go in and get that second shot. So why? Um, as we talked about earlier, getting only one dose of the COVID vaccine, well, the ones that require two doses, uh, the Pfizer and the Moderna, if we do those, then you're really not fully protected. And so then the question comes as variants come through, what is your protection then? We really want a very vigorous immune response, a really strong immune response to this virus. So as the variants come on through, and we have more and more exposure to it that will still be protected. So as far as the herd process, if we can get enough people vaccinated, then what ends up happening is there's less people available for the virus to go to. And that really was what herd immunity means, is that is there less and less people available to become infected, the chances of infection start to go down. And eventually, um, it's kind of like putting out a forest fire. It burns really hot, and then it's going to go out um, because the number of people able to get the infection gets so low that it just doesn't have people to get to. It's really hard to have happen. And that's what the herd does, is that so many are protected, it's really difficult for it to then spread through the, the group of people. Although we're not animals, we are in a way, but we're not a herd, but we are. <laughs> um, can you talk about previous SARS outbreak and if this COVID-19 uh, form has been treated differently? So this is a really different thing. So the SARS virus hit back uh, all those years ago now, um, you know, it came from overseas, ended up in Canada. Our friends in Toronto had an awfully tough time with it. So that SARS-CoV-1, which is what that one was called, um, you know, these severe acute respiratory syndrome viruses uh, are bad, as we have seen uh, with what, almost 600,000 uh, Americans now succumbing to this virus. Um, so SARS uh, is the end product. So it's the body's immune response to the virus. So when SARS, the first one that came through, it kind of burnt out quite quickly. And we figured that out is that it required a very large amount of virus from person to person to infect the other person. And because of that, it wasn't an efficient virus. And so just by doing some basic isolation, we were able to terminate that. There really wasn't a lot of good medications that were available at the time. It was quite novel. However, we did learn from that SARS uh, outbreak more about the um, coronaviruses, how they work, how to come up with vaccines against them. That's where the mRNA piece came in. 
Um, and then also to come up with maybe more specific antiviral medications, which are now on the forefront of, if you ever had influenza, you'll know that you may have gotten some Tamiflu. So you get an oral antiviral medication that then shuts off the virus and you get well quite quickly. That's coming next for uh, COVID-19 while they're working on coming up with that oral powerful antiviral medication um, to either prevent infection or to treat it once you have it. And that leads right into our next question. What specific medications are being used at the hospital to treat COVID-19? All right, so um, let's go two pathways. So one is, let's say you are mildly ill with COVID. Um, you don't require oxygen, but you wanna seek some medical care. Uh, treatment we would give there is now the monoclonal antibody therapies. Um, we have uh, here at McLaren Port Huron, we have the Bam Eddy and Regeneron. Those are the two different types of products that are available. So those monoclonal antibodies are laboratory made antibodies that are like what your body would do when you have a natural infection. So it's a concentrated dose of antibodies against the COVID-19 virus that will give you basically immediate protection. But it has to be early in the infection. It has to be early on. Um, so you have to be mildly ill. You have to have, first of all, you have to have cold, you have to have a positive test. Um, and you have to be mildly ill, not requiring oxygen, you can't be requiring hospitalization because only early in the process do the antibodies, if they're given, that's called um, a passive immunity, you know, giving it from another source, um, if we're to do that to protect you. Um, so we do that and we can give uh, monoclonal antibody therapy, which is exciting. We've done about 500 doses here through McLaren and it's had a great impact. We, um, at the state of Michigan, we probably, at their thought is, we probably saved about hundred people from getting hospitalized and going on to severe illness. So highly effective in preventing the disease from progressing. However, if you're ill enough to come to the hospital and you are ill enough to get admitted, uh, then we do have medications. Um, we use remdesivir, which is an antiviral medication. It's kind of a broad spectrum, um, but does give some help. Um, we know that there are some basic treatments. People that have COVID sick enough to be hospitalized, we give them steroid therapy. So they um, uh, get some uh, corticosteroid like salumedrol, uh, kind of drugs to help with the immune response and help tamper it down a little bit because it's so aggravated. We give low doses of some blood thinners so people don't get clots because one of the things that we know with COVID that blood clotting is so severe that people are ill enough to get hospitalized when we give them some anticoagulation. Now, if they're really severe, we give them more anticoagulation. So we've been able to do that and learn from that. We give them oxygen therapy in support of treatments um, like for other illnesses, uh, making sure that sodium, potassium, all that's all in good order. Um, so we do have some really specific things that we do that have worked really well. Um, we give oxygen in different types. So we have what's called high flow oxygen, we have AIRVO, uh, which is a high flow oxygen delivery device. We have BiPAP and then we have a ventilator. So we have different steps that we can utilize to treat people. And our goal is to never have somebody ill enough to have to get on the ventilator because that means their lungs are failing and they're not going to do well. And switching gears here, um, after full vaccination, will immunity show on an antibody test? So we get a lot of questions about antibody testing. So um, first of all, when we read about how they're even packaged and given to us, is that antibody testing is not to be used to see whether or not you've actually had the infection or not. Um, it's really not what they've been designed for, which is kind of unique. So let's just talk about antibody testing. So um, in drug trials, you know, in the vaccine trials, to be specific, um, they did come up with some ways to try to measure antibody response in some of the trial people. So let's say I was one of the first people I got it. They did develop a very specific test that the drug companies were utilizing for that, meaning that they were to look to see, did you make antibodies against the spike protein that is in their vaccine? So the difficulty is general laboratories that can make a um, COVID antibody test um, it isn't really specific, which means that it doesn't give us enough information to say, have I had the infection? Is it natural? Is it from the vaccine? Am I protected? Um, the testing that's available that we can get our routine laboratories is not enough to give us any specific information that'll help us. So we don't use antibody testing to make the determination of do you need to be vaccinated or not. Um, we don't use it to really help us guide much of anything. At the moment, at the experimental level, um, it does help us look to see with the drug company based type testing to see did their vaccine work. Um, and that's really about the only thing that we're doing with antibody testing right now. 
Um, can I be an asymptomatic carrier for COVID after I'm fully vaccinated? So that's a really great question. And we keep working on that. So we do have some data they just published from healthcare workers uh, because, you know, by our work and, and our, our ability to see a lot of people and have a lot of exposures, we've been tracked um, in our number of COVID infections that's occurred in us. So as they've been vaccinating us and we have a pretty high rate of vaccination as healthcare workers, they've looked to see how much, is, how much help did it give us. So if we look at the people that have been vaccinated versus not vaccinated in healthcare, so those that were vaccinated, um, virtually none of them required any specific interventions because they just didn't get sick. Um, those that weren't vaccinated went on just like the general public to have you know, a certain number, two or 3% to go on to get really, really sick. Um, but what was a little more exciting is that when they looked at what happened after I'm vaccinated and I'm exposed, and let's say I get a test and it's positive, did I make anybody else sick? The answer was no. So although you may test positive for it, it does not look like vaccinated people easily give the infection to others around them. So it's not absolute proof, but we're now getting more and more information that once you're vaccinated, it becomes less and less likely that you're gonna give the virus to other people. And that's important. Very good. Um, do you recommend fully vaccinated individuals be tested if they were exposed to COVID? So that has been somewhat answered by CDC that kind of helped us come up with some of this uh, material. So if I'm fully vaccinated and I go home and my family has COVID, um, I will not need to be tested because I'm fully vaccinated. Now that'll change if I do develop symptoms then I should be checked uh, for COVID and for other things too, because there's things other than COVID going on in our world. Um, so that is the current re recommendation from CDC is that if you're fully vaccinated and you have an exposure without symptoms, you do not need to be tested. And so we're talking about COVID tests. So um, what is your recommendation for accurate results? Um, and what about these home tests? What, what's your feeling right. on those? So early on, there were many, many COVID tests that became available. And fortunately, um, they stepped on in and you know, FDA looked and said, and you can't use a bunch of them because a lot of the tests that first came out were just not really good tests. However, our laboratory-based tests with our large laboratories and hospital laboratory testing, those have turned out to be really wonderful. Um, so the PCR and nucleic acid amplification, NAAT testing, those are wonderful. Those work really well, give us good results. Um, they tend not to have um, false positives and false negatives. They tend to be just like a really good test. Um, now, we do have some screening tests, and people that have kids in school have been seeing those. Those are the antigen tests. Um, they are not as sensitive. They don't pick up infection quite as easily, but a positive test is a positive test with those, so that's really important. But they're excellent screening tests because they're fast, they're easy, and they're inexpensive, and it starts to answer some questions of, especially in a group or a school or a sports team, um, that if you get them all and they're all negative, and that's highly likely that they don't have the infection around that group. And that's what's letting people kind of get back to some activities. Okay. This is a specific uh, question. If you have uh, heart arrhythmia, cardiomyopathy, long QT, or conduction problems, can the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine cause this to be worse, say with increased heart rate or palpitations? So that is a really specific question. So we know the mRNA vaccines when you are, are vaccinated. Um, that you're going to have an immune response. So that immune response is what we want. That's your body responding to the vaccine, uh, making antibodies, giving a T cell response. And some people may have a low grade fever with it. So if somebody does have some underlying cardiovascular issues, they need to make sure they take their temperature um, and treat their fever if they do have one. So they keep their temperature down. Uh, we've seen no significant cardiac toxic events occurring from the vaccinations. Um, and that's including the Johnson Johnson, um, as far as heart dysrhythmias, cardiomyopathy, or the difficulties. However, native infection, we've definitely seen a cardiomyopathy occur in somewhat otherwise healthy people who've had severe infection, but they'll get a cardiomyopathy, and it does give them some long-term difficulties with actual infection. So what happened to the seasonal flu? Well, that's a great question, but we think we have a pretty good answer. So we're acting differently. We've never acted like this before as a society. Um, we're sequestered, we're not going out, we're wearing masks in public, we're doing hand hygiene all the time. So we're doing all the things that inhibit viral transmission, whether it's SARS 
uh, which is COVID-19 or influenza, we're doing very good things to prevent transmission of viruses. So um, and remember influenza, it's a real droplet organism. So it requires when you cough or you sneeze and out it goes, it really requires that to, to get it from person to person. Uh, it requires a pretty good viral dose even. So um, by us doing all these good things of you know, avoiding crowds, washing our hands, wearing masks, we've effectively helped uh, prevent influenza over the last two seasons now. Very good. Um, and this is our last question. So I'd like you to sum up. So why do you think so many people are not getting vaccinated? So people that are not getting vaccinated, there's, there's lots of reasons. So um, we can go through several things. So let's talk about older people. Um, some older people that I've talked to, their concerns are, well, I just don't need it. Um, younger people will be like, I'm not going to get sick and I'm going to be just fine. Um, and then we have other people that, um, especially um, people of different communities, our African-American community, there's a lot of trust issues. So let's break this down. So when we look at older people, um, because it's a new vaccine, they are sometimes just concerned that it's new. But I'm going to step back to that this is the 21st century, and we've been really working on this kind of technology for about a decade. So although the vaccine itself is new, it really isn't new technology um, as far as the true mRNA component. So we're just good, right, as scientists. It's the 21st century. We've gotten good at it. So um, we're able to make things faster and better. And that's kind of what we've been doing all along. I don't think anybody looks at their computer and questions, why is today's computer faster and smarter than the one from 10 years ago? Because technology made it better. We have better chips and just things work better over time. We have better comp computer programs. So the same thing with vaccines. We've had time, energy, effort, and great science. So we've been able to get through that issue. As far as for younger people, um, they just don't think they're gonna get sick. And of course the answer is, is that statistically, most young people do really well with it. The problem is, now, there's several problems. So number one is we don't know who that person is going to be that is young, that's going to get COVID and get really sick and go on to die. And again, we were about 600,000 Americans that have gone on to die of COVID. The vast majority of them are older, but we have many younger people that have gone on to die. So um, I think it's really important that we consider that and, and consider that. Uh, people look at the young people. Oh, they're young. They don't get sick at all and they're going to be fine. Well, the problem with the young people, of course, is they get the infection and they give it to many other people. So they are able to transmit it readily, which is what the virus wants, right? It wants to get into us, so we give it to a bunch of people around us. So if we can get the younger people vaccinated, that's another way to stop this from going on through and hitting more and more people. Very good. Thank you so much for, for all the information that you provided with us. I hope that this does encourage more people to get out and, and get vaccinated. That is our goal. So that is gonna be, I think my, my parting, unless there's gonna be some more questions, is that you know COVID vaccine is yes new, but it is incredible science. It is doing a wonderful job. What we see here in the hospital, what we're seeing with our staff here is that people who are vaccinated are just not getting real sick. And that is really, really important. Um, if we are vaccinated and we're not gonna get sick and we don't give it to others, that's the way that we can make this get better and go away. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Brooks. And thank you Kelsey. everyone for joining in. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Take care.